the U.S. government through big tech and data farms and all that can predict your behavior. And we're getting to the point of, uh, of predict pre-crime. It, predict it, yep. So uh, jokingly, we often refer to the fact that Facebook knows when you're going to poop. I don't mean they know if you're feeling it. They know when you will before you even feel it. The way they do it is, uh, I wrote, there was a great article talking about this, and they, they used this as a joke to try and drive the point home. They, uh, uh, people don't understand the, the tiny bits of data and what, it, uh, and what it turns into and what it can mean. For instance, if you were to take all of your health data and then have a doctor look at it, they're going to be like, no idea. It looks like you're healthy. But there could be tiny markers here and there that are overlooked or not seen. You take the data of every person in this country, put it into a computer, the computer instantly recognizes these seemingly innocuous things all occur in people who 10 years later get cancer. So as a doctor can't make that correlation, the computer does. Facebook will, they know your location because most people have location services turned on. And they know that if someone sits still for 35 minutes, then gets up and moves two meters and then sits still again, they're going to go to lunch in 27 minutes on average. It's not perfect, but it, it's, it's probabilities. And so what happens is they know when you're going to eat. They know based on all of the movements you, you mentioned, the, the, your, the, the phone showing all the different places you've been and how long you were there. That easily gives them the data on when you are most likely to use the bathroom. They can also factor in proximity to bathrooms, meaning you're holding it and they know. But it's, it's silly. <laughs> but think about what that translates into. They can see you lost your job. They, they, they know that the, 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 the movements you've been making in your office have been increasingly become sporadic over the past uh, few weeks, indicating some kind of conflict or turmoil. There's stress factors. There's the frequency of messages you're sending. There's the amount of times you're going out to eat. Thus, you're likely to be fired or you know, quit your job. This also indicates you're less likely to have money. They can then look at how often you're driving your car, how often you're buying gas, and then predict 73.2% chance this individual will commit, will, will commit a crime within the next seven to eight months due to, you know, these factors. Then they put a flag out to, an, to a, a local law enforcement agency saying, here are your high, your, your, your high, high probability. Yeah. Yep. And the next, all of a sudden, one day you walk outside, you're still at your job. You weren't fired yet. You're likely you to be. You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything. And there's a cop outside your house looking at you as you walk by. Then the computer says law enforcement presence has decreased the probability of crime by 17.8%. All of those things could be happening right now. Or you're, are you, we, you're going to a drop box to stuff a bunch of ballots. You know, your location to, uh, well, to no, a... That, that they like, if they like it. If they like it. And then what they want to happen is they mm -hmm. want the other to get caught doing it and them to not get caught doing it. Yep. So they know, and, and think about how crazy it is, because if we get to this point where we truly have some like sentient AI, we are just pawn puppets in whatever that AI may be doing, whether it is conscious, sentient or not, you, it, it will just be a system that runs that no one has control of anymore. And so it will know. Actually, have you guys, I don't know if you watch movies or whatever, I just watched a Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. And this is basically, Me too. you saw it? Yeah, that was great. Yes, this is what it's about. That, you know, uh, Tom Cruise's character, was it Ethan Hunt or whatever, is, they, they all realize there is this AI that has infected the, the internet and it's be, they call it the entity. And everything they're doing has been predetermined by probability of what the machine expects them to do. And it's really, really crazy. I, I don't, I don't want to spoil the movie, but the, like, the villain is chosen specifically because of his relation to the antagonist and what the antagonist will respond and how will respond. So the, the, the entity, the AI, has planned out all of this. And it's like, even though the characters know they're on that path, they're given impossible choices, which push them in the direction of what the AI wants them to do. Hmm. And they can't, and like, to break free, now this is part one, I guess part two will be coming out at some point. I like the Mission Impossible movies, they're fun. But I, the way I've described the future is, Imagine a future where your job is indescribable. You have a gig app, you know, and so, you know, people are doing Uber and people are doing these gig economy jobs. So you wake up in your, your house or whatever, and you, you know, have breakfast and you're watching the news or whatever. And then all of a sudden your phone goes, Burr, and, you know, job quest or whatever the app is called says new task worth $75. And you're like, oh, 75 bucks. What do I got to do? And then it says, receive this object from this man and bring it to this address. And it's a picture of a guy. And then the object is this weird looking mechanical device. You have no idea what it is. And you go, oh, easy, I could do that. And you walk down, easiest job in the world. Guy hands you the thing, like, thanks, man. You click received. Then you walk to the address. 
uh, address and there's some guy standing there and he's like, you have the thing for me? I'm like, I sure do. He had it to him and then $75 in your account. You have no idea what you gave, no idea who you met, no idea what's going on and you don't care because now you go back home and you're $75 richer and it only took you 20 minutes. What a great job. And what you don't realize is it's all compartmentalized through this algorithm and you're building a nuclear bomb or you're, <laughs> you're building some kind of spaceship or doomsday weapon or new component that the AI system has determined it needed to increase its efficiency. You, the, these strange tasks that are indescribable. Right now, you know, your, your app says someone wants food. And you're like, oh, I get it. But what happens when we come to this job, like already with Fiverr, we're at the point where, hey, can you do an, a weird miscellaneous task for some money? Once we get to the point where you've got hyper specialized algorithmic prediction models or whatever, we get to the point where there's an app where it could be a human running it. And the human says, I want to build a rocket ship. And so what's the easiest way to do it? Is the easiest way to build a rocket ship to sit down over the course of a few years, having all these hiring meetings and interviewing people and trying to find someone who can build something or the McDonald's method. McDonald's, when they launched, they it, it, it used to be you needed a guy who knew how to cook. You got to get that burger just right. He's going to put the fixings all on it and then serve that burger. It takes a long time. You got to pay that guy a lot of money. McDonald's said, let's hire 10 people who can get good at one thing. And then someone grills the burger. Someone puts the burger on the bun. Someone puts the mayo and the mustard on it or whatever. Someone throws the fries in. One person for every small minor task, which is easier to do. We can get to the point where a human being with no specialties only needs to do the bare minimum of their skill set in order to help build a spaceship, a nuclear bomb, or even a skyscraper. And it sounds like, you know, there could be some good coming from it. Oh, maybe we can more um, efficiently produce buildings and more efficiently align people with jobs they might want to do. But then evil people, well, of course, will always weaponize this for evil ends. Or I think that the, the scarier prospect is the artificial intelligence just becomes outside of the confines of the humans who created it. The example I'll give you is Jack Dorsey. The best example of a human being who has guzzled their own refuse. Jack Dorsey builds, creates Twitter. Twitter then starts, the, the, the algorithm that they implement starts pushing out an ideology, which he then starts guzzling into his own mouth. So what happens is Twitter becomes a sewer of psychotic, fractured ideology. He's on Twitter reading the things that he produced and then consumed. And it pollutes his brain and, and breaks it. And a guy who went from from trying to create the free speech wing of the free speech party ends up having this interview with, with, with you know, between I and Joe Rogan and his lawyer about misgendering policies and other nonsensical uh, inane ideas because he's basically taken a taken a plug from his own ass and shoved it down his throat. It's it's this this information sewer of Twitter, the algorithm he created, the unintended consequences feeding himself. So when we look at, at YouTube and how they're feeding all of these children, these shock videos, what's going to happen is human society begins consuming its own waste and refuse. Refuse. These kids grow up with fractured minds because of this insane information they absorbed as children. And this leads to not a utopian future where AI gives us better li a better life. It leads to children growing up having deranged views of what is or should be. Uh... These kids who watched this weird stuff of Hitler, uh, you know, in a bikini, how many of them are going to have uh, depraved, degenerate uh, predilections where they're begging their wife to put the Hitler mustache on and other weird nonsense or showing up to work in bikinis with Hitler mustaches? Because as a child, this is what was jammed down their throat. Not everybody, but a lot of these kids may end up this way. And so one of the ways I describe the future is in the most inane way possible is corn. A future where all anyone ever talks about is corn. The biggest shows with 80,000 people in the stands and there's a husk of corn sitting on the stage and they're all just screaming. I love it. And then a guy walks up, you know, and he's like, would you, uh, you get the corn done today? That corn, yeah, corn's great. Why? Well, in the United States, we produce crap tons of corn. And so at the very, the most simple way to uh, explain this, the AI will be told to prioritize what humans need and desire. And it's going to look in the data and see that humans love making corn for some reason. It's going to then start prioritizing low level corn production. It's going to then start prioritizing the marketing of corn. And then eventually you have Taylor Swift on stage in a corn costume, shaking and dancing, going corn, corn, corn. And that will be normal to the people in this country because the algorithms have fed them this. Now, we can see the absurdity of corn. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. You can't see the absurdity <clears throat> of the invisible. <clears throat> so when, uh, and this is how I explained the, the, uh, how they target children. 
as adults, if we were we were told on YouTube to watch this video of Tucker Carlson complaining about immigration, we say, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll watch that. Next up, Hitler in a bikini doing Tai Chi. We'd be like, what? That's insane. Well, because we're adults. We've uh, become more resilient to the oddities and absurdities of the world. We've developed personalities and perspectives. Children don't have that safeguard. They'll just say, okay, I guess. They'll watch it. It will then become a part of their psyche and their worldview. Mm -hmm. When they're older, it won't be as something as obvious as corn. It can be psychotic things like I mentioned. Taylor Swift coming out on stage dressed up like a demonic winged Hitler screeching into the microphone, not even making any sounds or not even like any discernible uh, sound or pattern. And people in the, in the crowd just going screaming and clapping and cheering for it because an amalgamation of nonsense was fed into their brains. And that's the world we've created through the system. Can I, can I just connect up what you just said yeah. with what we've been discussing mm -hmm. uh, you know, earlier? Right now, uh, Google, um, Microsoft, some other companies to a lesser extent are integrating very powerful AIs. Uh, into their search engines and other tools that they have. So their so AIs are becoming part of those. So here's what's happening. More and more, uh, the bias in uh, search results, search suggestions, uh, answer boxes, the bias is actually being determined by an AI. Now, what this means is that to some extent right now, uh, it's AIs that are picking who's going to win elections. Because think about it, the executives or, or, or rogue employees at Google, they're not going to be interested in every single election, right? So that means that the vast majority of elections are in the hands of the algorithm itself. But now the algorithms more and more are in the hands of of smart AIs, which are getting smarter and smarter very, very rapidly. What this means is we are headed, I mean, at full, full steam, we are headed toward a, a world in which AIs are determining what people think and believe and who wins elections. Yeah, all kinds of elections. So, all so, kinds of elections. And then it, it, one, once the programmer consumes the refuse of the AI, they become slaves to it. Mm -hmm. But this, and, this and, is- and the, and the candidates. Yeah. And the candidates become captured as well. Now, over and over again, and I realized on this issue, I'm a broken record because I've, gotta, I've just got to get this <clears throat> into people's heads. This is another reason why we have to monitor, mm -hmm. why we have to capture this kind of content so that it can be used to at least to try to create effective laws and regu regulations. It can be used to bring- uh, court cases, you know, file lawsuits against these companies. Uh, it can be used in clever ways by by um, AGs and members of Congress. It can be used by public interest groups to apply pressure. You've got to collect the data. So again, I'm going to send people to mygoogleresearch.com because we desperately need people to sponsor our field agents. I I'm saying is this: there are problems that you can imagine things happening in the future. I'm saying a lot of this is actually happening right the second right now yeah. and these elections i mean you brought me back to 2016 that mm -hmm. election was rigged i mean here was trump well, it wasn't rigged enough though hillary, hillary tried she was using old school methods you know the old school stuff stuff the ballot box you know um get get ghost voters to vote but they, they they've advanced to the next but, it, but that's that yeah. wasn't really the rigging the rigging that actually was that was, was some level rigging but it wasn't but, but they, 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 i'm like i bet they've been doing that for 200 years <clears throat> oh you know yeah what I mean? oh like, yeah chicago kennedy right right that's, new york that's, city that's Tammany normal Hall. this yeah. is just politics it's that's politics. just normal and that's that's inherently <laughs> right. competitive, <laughs> it competitive <is>. and it's <laughs> not really a threat to democracy not really but what's but now you have a different kind of impact which is a threat to democracy, it undermines democracy because when these big companies want to favor one party or one candidate, there's nothing you can do. You can't counter it. You can't even see it, it unless you're Is it you're election interference in your mind? Are they interfering with elections? Is it, is is it subversive? Is it it's insurrection? <laughs> <laughs> it's insurrection. Uh, from from my perspective, given the the rock solid numbers I've been looking at for years, mm -hmm. yes, this is election interference. This mm -hmm. is undue influence. Absolutely, yeah. I, th I, th I think it's it's more than interference. I think we need to escalate that that rhetoric. It's uh, more like um, uh, election uh, control. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, they own it. 
They, they own the elections. They're not interfering. They're running our elections. They have subverted. They have, uh, uh, I would say this is seditious, that Google is committing, uh, engaged in a seditious conspiracy against the United States. We calculated that as of 2015, uh, Google alone was determining the outcomes of upwards of 25% of the national elections in the world. And it's gone up since then. Uh, as internet uh, penetration has increased, that percentage just keeps increasing and increasing. Hmm. So, you know- It would just be so wow. funny if like, what's really going on is that, you know, Sundar Pichai or whatever, he walks into a big room and there's a gigantic like r red light. And he's like, Google, tell us what we must do. And it's like, the next moves you will make. And it's like, the, the AI just owns them already. And we're sitting here complaining about it. Doesn't even care. That's, that's an interesting thought though. I mean, how, how are we, I mean, the, the fact that we're able to have this conversation at all means it's not lost. Uh, I don't know, because there is a kind of control, you know, that's called benign control. And my mentor at Harvard, I was B.F. Skinner's last doctoral student there, uh, he believed in benign control. Now, he, if he hadn't been cremated, he would be actually rolling over in his grave right now seeing what actually happened, because what he had in mind was there'd be these benevolent behavioral scientists and they'd be working with our, our government leaders and they'd be helping to create a society in which everyone is maximally creative, happy, and productive. That's what his idea was of benign control. But when we have a different kind of benign control that's actually come, come about and it's private companies that are not accountable to the public, they're in control. And from their perspective, they're benign because everything they're doing is in the interests of humanity. That's where we are, and that's, it's really hard to, how do you get the people at Google to understand that what they're doing is unacceptable? You know, even if we don't have specific laws in place. It's, uh, it's a battle of influence and power and authority. They're not going to, they don't care. Uh, they live in their world where they're drones to the, to the machine, and you, you can't wake up a person who's built for it. I, I do have some good news, which is that uh, the, some of the AGs I've been working with over the years, they're, they're just waiting. They're waiting until our system gets big enough. They're waiting until we have enough data, and they are gonna, they're going to try one legal theory after another. That's what, that's what you were doing just now. Yep. They're going to try out one legal theory after another to take these companies down. But you can't do it without the data. Last year, the Republican Party, I don't know if you remember this, sued Google because Google was diverting tens of millions of emails that the party was sending to its constituents yep, to and was diverting them to spam boxes. Yep, yep. That got kicked out of court almost immediately because they didn't have the data. But we can monitor that. We can monitor anything. And, w and walk into court with, an, with a massive amount of very, very carefully collected, you know, scientifically valid data. I, don't, I think we're well beyond uh, courts working and it mattering. Um, with, the, with the AI stuff we're seeing, there was this really crazy video we watched last night on the show of a car burning and it was generated in Unreal, Unreal Engine. Uh, but... If it were it not for them revealing that it was AI that was generated by the program, it looked real. So what happens now when audio gets released and it's uh, Donald Trump saying something naughty and uh, Trump sues for defamation. He goes to court and he says, this is an AI generated uh, uh, audio of my voice. And the court says, prove it. How do you uh, what do you mean? I heard you say it. And then he says, I have an expert here. And the expert says, I, I looked at the uh, the waveform and using the forensic tools, it determined it is an AI. And then the defense goes, we've got an expert here. This expert says, uh, no, uh, uh, we checked it and it sure, no, no, it's real. Trump said it. That's it. We had this case yesterday. I mean, or, or two days ago where uh, it was a DeSant DeSantis campaign was putting in images of President Trump and uh, Fauci. Oh, that was, a, that was a couple months ago. It was a while. Okay, yeah. Those, some, those, some see, news, yeah. There, there was somebody that put it out that they-, they DeSantis campaign did. Yeah. But they they had inst they proved which one was the fake one and which one was the we we, we cover this yeah. extensively yeah. now the, the issue here is the, the DeSantis campaign uh, falsely uh, generated three images of yeah. uh, uh, of Trump or I should say generated three images of Trump hugging or kissing Fauci mm -hmm. put them alongside real images and then wrote real life Trump over it now the AI isn't to the point where it is to the point where they can get away with it but they did not do a good enough job right. text in the background on one was garbled nonsense because we're not quite there yet. 
And it was quickly pointed out within a, it, took, it took a couple days before people realized what they had done because nobody analyzed, uh, scrutinized the video to, to, a, to a great degree. The DeSantis campaign asserted their right to fabricate images to manipulate the voters and uh, uh, have still not, as far as my understanding is, they never took it down. And they've defended their right to do it because other people have made memes in the past. <laughs> and I think this is abject evil. They're basically like they want to trick people into thinking Trump hugged and kissed Fauci. Now, Trump was very favorable to the guy. And I think that criticism is 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 welcome. But this is a whole new level of opening the door towards just abject evil. The issue becomes we're, we're six months away. In fact, we're probably already we're here. 90 days from Iowa, the Iowa caucus. Oh, but I, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. think we're already at the point where technology can create images and video that is indistinguishable from real life. There's a lot of it out and there. And there's now. no way to yeah. prove it. Right. The only issue is, has the public accessed it and learned to properly utilize these systems just mm -hmm. yet? 11 Labs is a program where I can take 15 seconds of your voice and instantly recreate it. I love it. You watch these movies like Mission Impossible, and they're like, they need the guy to say this sentence. And then once he does, they're like on the other line, and they have the computer and the suitcase. And it's like, the guy's giving a note, and he's like, why am I reading this? Like, well, can you read the line, sir? It's for the, okay, the, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog at midnight to follow the crow. What is this all about? And then they're like, we got him to say it. And then they press a button, and it replicates his voice. You don't even need that. You can take 12 seconds of someone just saying, uh, I woke up this morning to get breakfast and I had uh, uh, bacon and eggs. And just you with have, that alone. You have every digital component to, to make it into whatever. Yeah. And so you can go to 11labs.io right now and it's like five bucks and you can run anyone's voice in this. A year ago, some, some uh, uh, students cloned Joe Rogan's voice and it was shocking. Everyone was like, oh my God, how did they do what? And they took the website down saying, you know, it's not fair to Joe and we just wanted to prove that we could do it. Now there's a public website where anyone for a couple bucks can replicate any voice. How will you be able to prove it in court? You can't. Why? It's going to come down to experts. The Kyle Rittenhouse case may have been one of the first cases, and I, I'm not a legal expert, where we saw the prosecution attempt to use AI generated images to convict someone of a crime. It, it, it may not be the first time, but this is a high profile case. And what, what happens is the prosecution shows a grainy camera camera image of Kyle Rittenhouse and then they digitally zoom so you can look closer. Digital zoom is an AI generated image. There's no way to create pixels to show what it really was. The computer makes its best guess as to what would be there as you zoom in and then AI generates an image of what it thinks it would be. They then told the court, see, he's pointing the gun in this direction. Hmm. Now, what happened was the judge allowed them to admit AI generated images. Crazy. And when the defense said that is AI generated, the judge is like, well, I don't know. Let the jury decide.